section thirty two of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter twenty five the supple jack proceeds up the piranha fired at from the shore meet with friendly natives jose goes in search of the midshipmen returns with tidings of them jose left behind the brig sails on fired at from the shore passing batteries under a heavy fire the brig frequently struck several people killed and wounded gets clear at last the night was calm the brig lay on the entre rios shore the inhabitants of which were friendly tall trees clothed the bank towering high above her masts while on the southern shore scarcely a tree was to be seen a mist hung over the water and though the stars shone brightly from the sky overhead partly obscured that side of the river and rendered the night darker than usual jack and terence had enjoyed a couple of hours of sound sleep not idling their time over it as adair observed when the sound of a gun made them both leap out of their berths it was followed by another and another the next moment bevan came down they are firing at us sir from the shore he said shall we return it not till the shots come unpleasantly near answered jack the flash of our guns might show them the proper range which at present they do not appear to have got turn up the hands but show no lights meantime the enemy continued firing the shot occasionally passing close ahead or astern at last one cut the fore topmast stay a second whistled between the masts two others followed at a short distance ahead they have got the range now cried jack it is time to reply to them long tom was brought to bear on the spot whence the flashes proceeded for the guns themselves could not be seen his first bark as needham called it was replied to by several shots but they did no damage depressed the gun slightly that shot went over them said jack long tom gave a second bark no reply came a third and fourth followed it was evident that the shot had told with considerable effect and that the enemy had thought it wiser to beat a retreat we have done with them at present observed jack but we shall probably have a good deal of this sort of work going up the river the rockets with which we have been supplied will come into play i suspect at all events the trip is not likely to be a dull one observed adair i only wish that we had the youngsters on board as there appeared no probability of the brig being again attacked the guns were secured and the watch below turned in of course every possible care was kept to prevent surprise should the enemy venture to make another attack which was not however at all likely to occur the next morning the wind again set up the river and the supplejack continued her course no enemy appeared but occasionally a few country people were seen on the banks who seemed simply from curiosity to be watching the brig as she glided by a vigilant lookout was kept on the bare possibility that the midshipmen might have made their escape and gained the bank in the hopes of being taken off by any passing vessel jose however was still confident that they had been carried off to the north and were not likely to be found in that part of the country the current being strong and the wind light the supple jack made but slow progress at last she reached a place at which jose had desired to be landed he had friends in the neighbourhood he said and felt confident that he should gain tidings of the midshipmen the river was here wide and as she kept close on the opposite shore even should the enemy appear their field pieces were not likely to do much harm to the brig the wind had again fallen and the delay indeed had there not been an important object to be obtained could not have been avoided 
farther on where the river narrowed at rosario jose told them that they might expect to meet with considerable opposition perhaps that was his reason for not desiring to accompany them further as soon as the brig had brought up a boat was lowered and adair conveyed their very doubtful friend to the shore he took ten men armed with muskets beside the crew in case the boat should be attacked set your mind at ease on that point said jose they are my friends hereabouts and bear no enmity to the english as the boat approached several country people were seen coming down the steep bank with fowls and vegetables which they were perfectly ready to sell jose was recognized by several persons who seemed surprised at seeing him but he had a talk with them after which they became thoroughly friendly and willing to communicate information terence learnt from them that the squadron had passed up and had already got considerably higher than rosario where jose had told jack that he might expect to be attacked probably rosas after the lesson he received at obligado is unwilling again to interfere with us thought terence perhaps however he expects by allowing us to pass up to catch us all in a net and so prevent our return if he does that same he will find that he is mistaken and that he has not yet learnt what british seamen are made of terence with his stock of fresh provisions was heartily welcomed on board he and jack only hoped that they might be detained for want of wind where they were till the return of jose with any information he might collect they had agreed at all events to wait for him till the following morning he was he had said certain that rosas must have passed either through the village or at no great distance from the river and he hoped to hear that the young midshipman had been seen with his troops next morning at daybreak terence taking the same precaution as before returned to the shore he had not been there long before several country people appeared but nothing was seen of jose gonzalves adair after waiting some time began to fear that he had either been captured or was playing them false he was about to return on board to let the men have their breakfast when the spy was seen his horse in a foam galloping down the hill towards the boat any news of the young officers asked adair eagerly yes signor important news they were alive a week ago and though i don't know what the general might have done with them had his anger been aroused they were not ill-treated but i find that they made their escape at the time i mention and have not since been heard of i am afraid therefore and jose shook his head that they may have been overtaken by some of the gaucho cavalry who would not scruple to run them through with their lances or they may have been seized by a jaguar and we have not a few man-eaters in these parts fierce creatures who would quickly put an end to a couple of lads not long since one leaped on board a vessel moored to the banks and carried off a man asleep on the deck there is no telling what they will not do or if the young officers have escaped the gauchos and jaguars they may have wandered far away from any habitation and have been starved to death the country people would not hurt them and would provide them with food but as i say i have been unable to obtain any further tidings of them which makes me fear the worst well come on board and give your information to the commander we will then consult what is to be done said adair you have taken a great deal of trouble without having gained your reward jose shrugged his shoulders paciencia senor i am an unfortunate man i know but if you will excuse me i will continue the search it is possible that none of the accidents i have mentioned may have happened to the young officers and perhaps they are hiding in some rancho or have managed to find subsistence by themselves you englishmen do wondrous things only as they have no guns and cannot i conclude use a lasso even if they have one they will have been unable to catch game or obtain any other food terence after due consideration seeing that there would be no great use in taking jose with him and that he might be of more service by remaining on shore returned on board with the unsatisfactory information as he believed it which he had obtained 
as to its being unsatisfactory i am not so sure of that observed jack as the lads escaped being killed at first and were not as jose said ill-treated we may hope that they have found the means of supporting themselves in their wanderings and that they have either made their way back to obligado or have reached the banks of the river as they decidedly have their wits about them they may have found subsistence where others might have starved indeed as i think of it though you have to share my anxiety i cannot help feeling glad that desmond was with tom had he been alone the case would have been different youngsters may occasionally lead one another into scrapes but they are as sure to help each other out of them the calm still continued and thus a longer time was given to jose to continue his search for the midshipmen in the afternoon smoke was seen in the distance up the river jack guessing that it proceeded from the funnel of a steamer sent terence in a boat to intercept her and learn the news she brought the satisfactory intelligence that the squadron had reached baxadar de santa fe without molestation with their convoy of merchantmen of which there were upwards of one hundred sail collected off the place the commodore had gone up the river some hundred miles farther to corrientes the capital of the province of that name to communicate with the government on diplomatic matters the town is situated near the spot where the river paraguay falls into the parna at first it was believed that rosas after the lesson which had just been given him at obligado would not venture to interfere with us again and would be ready to sue for peace observed the commander of the steamer but he has made us no overtures and from the information we have gained he seems as determined as at first to hold out i suppose there is but little chance of our being molested however as we go up said adair i am not quite so certain of that was the answer rosas thinks he has got us in a trap and as i passed the cliffs of san lorenzo i observed a large number of men assembled who quickly got out of the way as i came within shot of them they were evidently at work throwing up batteries and had their guns been ready depend on it they would not have allowed me to pass so easily i can promise that you will not get up without some warm work here and there well we must be prepared for them said adair we have a good supply of rockets and our carronades will pepper them with grape and canister while long tom will play his part as he always does i would advise you not to expose your men more than you can help observed the commander of the steamer a sailing vessel would have but a poor chance when going up the river should the wind fail her under a battery we must run it at all events and wishing his friend good-bye adair returned on board with the information he had gained the calm still continued but as a breeze might at any moment spring up jack and he anxiously looked out for jose they were indeed in a hurry to recommence the ascent of the river for the longer they delayed the greater risk they ran of being attacked the sun set and still jose had not made his appearance jack was just going below when needham came aft no one had showed more anxiety about the midshipmen than he had it has come into my mind sir that if the young gentlemen are anywhere hereabouts they may have caught sight of the brig and will be trying to make their way down to the shore abreast of us if you will give me leave to take the jolly boat i will pull in and have a look for them and even if they don't come jose may be wishing to get off with any information he has picked up though i have no great hopes that he will do much i am afraid not either said jack but by all means take the boat and remain as long as it continues calm should a breeze spring up you must whether successful or not return on board it is my duty to proceed up the river as fast as i can and my anxiety to recover my brother and mr desmond must not make me neglect that needham found no difficulty in obtaining volunteers for his expedition they went well armed in case any hostile natives might appear though the country people in general showed a friendly disposition jack and terence while at their frugal supper of corned beef and biscuit talked over a plan for protecting the men should they be fired at as they ascended they arranged to build a barricade of hammocks and bags to defend the helmsman on the port side while the crew were sent below they of course intending to remain on deck 
the fellows have not shown themselves to be good shots and if the breeze holds we may run by them without much damage observed jack but if the wind should fall or blow down the river suggested terence then we must go about and wait for a better opportunity for running up answered jack we may try it at night and may slip by the more dangerous places without observation they both talked hopefully of recovering the midshipmen and yet they could not help occasionally feeling that the youngsters might after all have lost their lives at last they turned in bevan having the watch though very gallant british officers they were not heroes of romance and therefore required sleep as much as anybody else jack had left directions to be called should a breeze spring up or needham return on board it had gone two bells in the morning watch when norris came into the cabin and awoke jack there is a light air from the southard and it has been getting stronger for the last few minutes but the boat has not come off yet he said jack sprang up we will make sail and stand over to the other shore to pick her up he answered we must not delay a moment the anchor was hove up and sail quickly made the breeze rapidly increasing she had got halfway across to the western shore when the boat was observed approaching and was soon alongside we have seen nothing of the young gentleman sir nor has the spy shown his face said needham i waited till the last moment hoping that some one would appear i fancied i saw people moving about on the bank and now and then heard voices close down to the boat we pulled some way down the river and then back again as high up as we had gone down every now and then shouting out the young gentlemen's names so that if they had been anywhere hereabouts they must have heard us jack agreed with needham that tom and gerald were not likely to be in the neighbourhood and the boat being dropped astern to be in readiness should they or the spy appear the supple jack continued her course up the river the increasing daylight enabled jack to see his way and of course a sharp lookout was kept on the shore the brig continued on for some distance neither cavalry nor artillery being seen a few foot-soldiers were observed trudging along and occasionally country people appeared on the high ground but none of them came down to the beach the appearance of the banks varied considerably in different places in some they were sloping and were covered with trees and shrubs in others they consisted of high earthy cliffs with the open plains of the pampas reaching to the edge of their summits frequently the telescope revealed projecting from the cliffs the bones of the megatherion mastodon mylodon and other huge antediluvian animals of which however neither jack nor terence knew the names sometimes they were so distinct that they were remarked by the men who wondered how such strange animals could have found their way there they cannot have gone and buried themselves sagaciously observed bill lizard the boatswain's mate for my part howsomedever i cannot think that anybody would have taken the trouble to bury them answered needham it's a pity we have not got mr scrofton on board he would have told us all about it no doubt the ship's company however had soon other matters to engage their attention the brig was now approaching that part of the river where the deep channel runs under the lofty and perpendicular cliffs of san lorenzo the bed is as wide as in other places but on the eastern side is a line of islands extending for several miles and forcing the current over to the west it was still doubtful however whether the enemy had observed the brig or would venture to attack her if they had terence had gone aloft to be able to get a better view over the plain when he made out several horsemen and what he at first took for carts in the far distance but which as they emerged from a cloud of dust partially concealing them he discovered were field pieces there could be little doubt that the supple jack would not escape without being fired at fortunately there was a good stiff breeze and under all sail she stood boldly up the clearly defined channel the ensign was flying at the peak and jack ordered one to be hoisted at each masthead to show the enemy that he intended to fight as long as the mast stood or his vessel remained above water the brig had not got far however when six field pieces dragged by horses with a considerable body of men were seen some way ahead approaching the edge of the cliffs 
jack was not left long in doubt as to their object for bringing their guns to bear on the brig the spaniards opened fire their shot whizzing over the brig a few only passing through her sails needham had got his beloved long tom elevated as much as possible the two carronades loaded with canister and the rockets were ready in their stands let them learn what long tom can do said jack needham fired but the shot flew over the heads of the enemy the gun was quickly again loaded after the next shot two or three of the horses were seen plunging wildly and one of the guns appeared to have received some damage the distance was too great to ascertain what it was the brig made rapid way the next shot buried itself in the cliff it was evident that long tom could do no more for the present the carronades were now fired and a flight of rockets sent the horsemen galloping out of the way while the gunners scampered off or threw themselves on the ground a second flight of rockets and another dose of canister kept them from returning till the brig had neared the cliffs so close indeed was she that her main-yard almost touched them while the enemy who by this time had returned could not sufficiently depress their guns to send a shot down on her decks neither did the riflemen approach sufficiently near the edge to fire into her probably having a wholesome dread of the rockets or bullets which might be sent in return from the daring little vessel as yet no one had been hit on board the brig and jack was beginning to hope that she might pass without damage beyond the dangerous point when farther on appeared a line of batteries and he had just reason to fear that they would cause him greater injury than he had hitherto received he pointed them out to terence i would advise you to send the hands below while you and i and the helmsman remain on deck said terence coolly we shall save the men and should a few shots go through the ship's side we shall have time to stop the holes before much water gets in there would be no use replying to the batteries and we must do our best to get by them as fast as possible the order which the men unwillingly obeyed was given snatchblock came aft to the helm and terence walked forward while jack stood at his usual post to calm the brig needham gave a fond look at long tom as he went below i only wish old fellow that i could stop on deck and let you send a shot or two into those batteries ahead he exclaimed apostrophizing his gun jack and terence felt something like men leading a forlorn hope but felt that they must of necessity expose themselves to the round shot and bullets of the enemy they had not long to wait before the guns from the battery opened fire the first shot struck the starboard bulwarks and went through them the next plunged right down on the deck and others followed in quick succession the enemy now opened with grape and canister numerous shots passing through the sails and several others striking the deck and bulwarks had the crew not gone below many must have been killed or wounded jack and terence now the only two exposed were still unhurt though several missiles whistled close to their ears and half a dozen lodged in the barricade erected for the protection of snatchblock all jack's attention was required for conning the brig so that he could attend to nothing else after a shot had gone through the deck he heard cries proceeding up the hatchway as if some one had been hurt below but he had no time to inquire who was the sufferer though from his natural temperament he took a pleasure in being under fire still he never so heartily wished himself out of it as he did at present it would have been a different matter had he been able to defend his ship instead of being compelled to glide slowly by and be peppered at without returning a shot it was indeed extremely trying and it seemed a wonder considering the number of shots fired down into her that she was not sent to the bottom at length the brig had to stand farther out from the cliffs in a direction where fewer guns could reach her and jack determined to try if he could not silence those likely to annoy him with a few rockets and a dose of canister from the carronades calling needham and a dozen of hands on deck he gave the order never did men spring up with greater alacrity terence directed the rockets which pitched right into the fort while the canister coming directly after must have driven the spaniards from their guns for not a shot was returned till the brig was pretty well out of their reach the rest of the crew now came on deck and gave a loud cheer at the success of their exploit they had not however escaped altogether one had been killed and two wounded below a shot entering the gun-room had also killed the clerk in charge and slightly wounded jos green 
though the brig had passed the partly formed batteries she was not altogether free from danger troops of flying artillery were observed moving along at the top of the cliffs accompanied by a body of infantry though the brig had a strong breeze as the current was against her she advanced but at a comparatively slow rate the troops above getting along almost as fast as she did a shower of grape from the carronades and a couple of rockets sent into their midst made them however sheer off to a respectful distance and the gallant little supplejack continued her course without being further molested the dead were sewn up in their hammocks with shot at their feet and lowered into the deep stream as there was no prospect of being able to bury them on shore jos green made light of his wound as he did of every other trouble in life and jack felt thankful considering the hot fire to which the brig had been exposed that more casualties had not occurred End of section thirty two section thirty three of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter twenty six the midshipmen seen on the shore a boat sent from the brig the enemy appear on the cliffs and open fire the brig returns it the midshipmen rescued the brig gets clear of the enemy tom recounts his and gerald's adventures evening was approaching all hands had been busy repairing damages the carpenters below stopping shot holes the rest of the crew on deck knotting and splicing the rigging some way ahead was seen a lofty bluff with a range of cliffs which the chart showed extended far along the shore a shoal ran off it so the brig had of necessity to steer some distance over to the opposite bank as had been done all along a vigilant lookout was kept for any object moving on the western side needham's keen eye was employed in the service he felt a sincere affection for the youngsters and longed to recover them almost as much as did their relatives just abreast of the brig appeared a shallow valley with a stream in the middle and trees growing on either side reaching down to the edge of the water needham was examining the spot with even more than his usual care i am sure of it he exclaimed suddenly one of them is waving his handkerchief or a bit of rag of some sort it must be the young gentleman jack and terence brought their glasses to bear on the spot the pinnace towing astern was hauled up alongside terence and needham jumped into her with a ready crew just as she was shoving off a party of artillery and a body of infantry appeared on the cliffs above Take six small armed men in case the enemy should see the lads and attempt to stop them exclaimed jack the muskets will probably keep the spaniards at a distance while they get on board the men who had been called away having received their ammunition were in a few seconds in the boat which now pulled as fast as the crew could bend to their oars towards the shore the enemy must have been surprised at seeing her for not having discovered the midshipmen they probably did not conceive for what object she was approaching the shore in the meantime the carronades had been turned towards the cliff and the rockets got ready until fired on however jack had determined not to fire indeed his shot at the distance he then was from the cliffs could not have told with much effect as it would have been unwise to heave to in so dangerous a position the topsails were lowered on the caps and topgallant sails and royals let fly so as not to leave the boat behind the midshipmen for there was no doubt that it was they who were seen in their eagerness to get on board the boat came out from beneath the overhanging shrubs which had hitherto concealed them from the view of those on the cliffs to the end of a point the enemy caught sight of them and now understanding the object of the boat instantly began firing at her while a party of men hurried down to try and cut them off 
we must put a stop to that cried jack giving orders to open fire with long tom and the carronades the enemy replied with their field pieces the brig having edged over as close as she could venture opened on them with rockets the boat by this time had scarcely got half-way to the shore while the two midshipmen seeing the party coming to intercept them threw themselves into the water and swam off to the boat regardless of the bullets flying about their heads they struck out boldly the boat's crew pulling with all their might to reach them while the small arm men kept up a sharp fire on the enemy at the top of the cliffs which prevented them from taking so accurate an aim as they would otherwise have done jack watched them with the deepest anxiety he saw the shot splashing into the smooth water and bounding over them one better aimed might send either of the lads to the bottom he had not however forgotten that he had charge of the brig and was obliged to turn his eyes away from them to look after her tom being a better swimmer than gerald might quickly have been on board but in spite of the bullets which came flying around his head he was seen to stop and support his companion just like him exclaimed needham i would give every year i have to live to save the lads just then one of the small arm men in the boat was hit and dropping his musket he sank down across the thwarts needham seized it and catching sight of a spaniard aiming at the lads he fired the man dropped his piece which went off in the air a few more strokes and the boat was up to the midshipmen eager hands were stretched out to haul them on board take him first cried tom and terence grasping his nephew's hands lifted him on board needham hauled in tom and after the boat had been put round the crew pulled away for the brig several round shot were fired at her but fell fortunately either ahead or astern the musketry was most annoying but as the summit of the cliff offered no shelter to the spaniards they were exposed to a sharp fire kept up by the small arm men in the boat and were obliged to retreat in order to reload their pieces every time they fired they could thus as they ran forward to the edge take but an unsteady aim as soon as the midshipmen were in the boat needham gave up the helm to terence and reloading his musket continued to fire at every spaniard who appeared eager as terence was to learn how the midshipmen escaped there was no time just then to ask them questions the boat was quickly alongside tom and gerald managed to climb on deck without much assistance jack only gave tom a short and hearty greeting he then ordered him and desmond at once to go below and stow themselves away we must not have you hit now we have got you he said we will hear all about your adventures when we are out of fire and that will be i hope before long though several shot had struck the brig no one was killed and two men only slightly wounded while as far as could be seen from her deck it was believed that the enemy had suffered pretty severely the flying artillery continued along the edge of the cliffs and occasionally fired a shot but at last the ground sloping and being rough and uneven and covered with trees they were unable to make way and wheeling round disappeared a shot from long tom which had been brought to bear on them making them gallop off at the top of their speed as it was now growing dusk and the wind had fallen the supple jack came to an anchor tom and gerald had in the meantime got a change of clothes and enjoyed a hearty meal which they acknowledged they greatly wanted jack had desired them to go to his cabin and by the time he could leave the deck he found them sitting there laughing and talking as if nothing very particular had occurred well my boys you don't seem much the worse for your adventures he said as he took his seat at the table no sir answered gerald the swim was the worst part of them indeed had it not been for tom i believe i should have sunk before the boat could have picked us up 
i want you to tell me all that happened to you how you escaped from the gauchos who we heard carried you off and how you managed to make your way to the river which we by the by always thought that you would do if you could are we to begin from the first asked tom yes answered jack i should like to hear all about it and how the gauchos did not kill you at first i am sure i thought that they would when i found one of their long lassos round my waist and myself hauled along till the breath was nearly squeezed out of my body the fellow who caught hold of me however dragged me quickly upon his saddle and galloped away like the wind i saw that gerald was treated in the same manner and though i was sorry for him i must confess that i was glad to have a companion in my misfortune i fancy that the fellows thought they had got hold of two very important personages away we went for some twenty miles or so without drawing rein when we found that we had reached the camp of general rosas had he been at obligado i suspect that his troops would not have run away so soon our captors carried us at once into his presence and were somewhat disappointed by finding that we were only a couple of midshipmen and not the important personages they supposed the general however told them to take care of us and bring us along with him as he was marching with the chief part of his army to the northward i must say that our captors were not bad-tempered fellows and we soon got into their good graces by talking and laughing though they could not understand much more of what we said than we could of their language they got us each a horse which was much pleasanter than riding behind them and at night we lay down to sleep with a horse rug over us and our saddles for pillows we asked them to teach us how to use the lasso whenever there was a halt and they were surprised to find how well we soon learnt to use it though of course we could not equal them whenever we encamped they and a good many others used to go out foraging in all directions and as there was game of all sorts we never came back without a supply their mode of catching partridges is very curious each man supplies himself with a long thin stick at the end of which a loop is attached he rides on till he sees a covey of birds on the ground and then instead of darting at them he circles round and round the birds not attempting to fly do nothing but run along the ground the gaucho keeps narrowing his circle till he gets within reach of a bird when he drops the loop over its head and whips it up a prisoner on his saddle they used to catch a number of birds in this way and in an hour or so a fellow would have a dozen or more hanging to his saddle we imitated them and after a little practice we also managed to catch a good many though we did not equal them of course from the first we determined to make our escape and we agreed that if we could catch birds in this way we might supply ourselves with food in the wilder places we found a number of animals very much like rabbits only with longer tails and larger teeth which live in burrows close together before camping in an evening we saw hundreds of the creatures sitting on their haunches in front of their burrows they would look at us for some time as if wondering who we were and would then scamper off and pitch down head foremost into their holes giving a curious flourish with their hind legs and tails before they disappeared they are much more difficult to catch than the partridges though we still hoped to get hold of some of them should we be hard pressed for food when the day's march was over the gauchos amused themselves by horse racing gambling either with cards dominoes or coin a sort of pitch and toss game and they would frequently make bets on the strength of their horses to settle the point their plan was to fasten the two horses stern to stern by a short lasso secured to the saddle or girth of either animal at a short distance from each other the gauchos having mounted their respective horses one being placed on one side of a line drawn on the ground and the other on the other side then set to work to lash and spur their steeds in opposite directions until the strongest drew the weaker over the line the former being thus declared the victor 
their custom of racing gave desmond and me the idea that we might manage some evening to make our escape we appeared always to watch their performances with great interest and at last we proposed to race any of them who would like to try with us none of the grown men would condescend to do so but two lads came forward and agreed to start away we went to the westward taking good care to let our competitors win next evening we had another race when we were again beaten hollow we complained that it was the fault of our horses and that if they would give us better ones they should see that englishmen were able to ride as well as they could they agreed to this and we started in the same direction as before gerald's horse was the best and reached the tree which was to be our goal before either of the young gauchos who however got in before me i had as long as i was in sight of the camp belaboured and spurred my steed but as soon as our competitors got ahead of me i let the animal go at the pace he chose we had now we hoped gained the confidence of our captors and gerald and i agreed that the next evening we would propose racing together we had each of us some reals and smaller pieces of money in our pockets we pulled several of them out as stakes which to assist in disarming suspicion we gave to one of the gauchos to hold for us this evening we were fortunately on the right of the camp that is to say on the side nearest the river we fixed on a tree which appeared on the outskirts of a wood in the south-east as our goal we both pretended to be much interested in the race and jabbered away in the same fashion as they do we felt anxious enough as you may suppose about the result though not in the way our captors fancied we had managed to get hold of some line which we stowed in our pockets as well as enough food to last us for a couple of days at all events the gauchos seemed to think it very good fun not in the slightest degree suspecting our intentions having furnished us with whips and fastened huge spurs to our feet they assisted us to mount our somewhat fiery steeds when once in our saddles we stuck on like wax though the animals did their best to get rid of us our only fear was that some of the gauchos might take it into their heads to accompany us which would have effectually prevented the success of our undertaking we rode backwards and forwards several times among the men and talked away to each other in the style they were accustomed to do our object being to put off starting as long as possible till darkness was approaching that we might have a better chance of escaping at last we could delay no longer so riding up side by side to the natives we begged them to start us fairly when off we set digging our spurs into our horses flanks and whacking the unfortunate beast with our whips the tree towards which we were directing our course was fully half a mile off and as the border of the wood was in shadow we hoped that we should be able to get into it and pass through on the other side before our flight was discovered we dared not turn our heads to see if we were followed but keeping close together urged on our steeds till the wood was reached a narrow opening which we had not before perceived was before us we dashed into it and to our satisfaction found that we were not compelled even to pull rein but galloped on as fast as at first we were now sorry that we had not started earlier as we should have had more daylight to see our way another wide extent of open ground was before us we urged on our steeds across it their feet narrowly escaping the rabbit holes which existed in one or two parts we escaped them however and reached a copse through which we in vain tried to find a passage for our horses afraid at last of losing time and being overtaken we agreed to abandon them and make our way on foot towards the river which we thought must be at no great distance desmond proposed that we should fasten our silver spurs and whips to the saddles to show the owners that we did not wish to steal their property no sooner however had we dismounted than having incautiously let go our reins while we were unstrapping our spurs our steeds galloped off and prevented us from putting our laudable intentions into execution 
it was well that we did not do as we proposed we agreed because should our steeds return the gauchos would know that we had intentionally made our escape whereas now they might suppose we had tumbled off and broken our necks or at all events have been unable to remount in either case the fellows will probably come to look for us observed desmond for they will not like to lose their spurs on which they set high value well then we will fasten them and our whips on this branch which will show them the honesty of our intentions if they come to look for us i said we shall have at all events several hours start as they cannot get through the copse on horseback better than we can we did as i proposed and then plunging into the copse tried to make our way through it we tore our clothes and nearly scratched our eyes out however but still we made way our chief fear being that we might fall in with a jaguar but as we had heard that they are cowardly beasts and will not attack two people together we were not much troubled on the subject before it grew quite dark therefore we cut two sticks to defend ourselves and two long wands such as the gauchos use for catching birds the thick sticks helped us also to make our way through the bushes the stars soon came out brightly and enabled us to keep a tolerably direct course towards the east still we could not help wishing to get out of the wood as soon as possible i had heard about jaguars tracking people the unpleasant thought came across me that one might at any moment pounce down upon us i did not tell desmond not wishing to make him as uncomfortable as myself on the subject i was afraid had we shouted which would have been the best means of keeping these creatures off that we might be heard by the gauchos or any other enemies who might pursue us and as that was the greatest risk of the two i thought it would be wiser to make our way in silence at last we again got into open ground and fancied that we were going to make good progress when suddenly we ran against an object which made us start back with several severe pricks in our legs and hands had we not had our sticks before us we should have been regularly impaled on examination we found that they were those prickly plants which we used to call puzzle monkeys in the west indies only these grew like so many sword blades with thorns on both sides sticking out of the ground it was impossible to get through this bristling barrier so we had to turn on one side and run along it hoping at length to double round the end the hedge might for what we knew extend for miles and we were almost in despair for should the gauchos follow us we should lose all chance of escaping at last however we came to a dip our hopes revived it was we felt sure the head of a valley for we saw the ground rising on the other side and that it must lead us down to the piranha itself or to some stream running into it trees instead of those abominable prickly pears thinly covered the banks and on reaching the bottom we found a rivulet from which we thankfully quenched our thirst we agreed that things were beginning to look brighter the horsemen were not likely to find us and we should have no difficulty in making our way either in the water or along the edge of the stream gerald reminded me that bruce or some other scotch hero of ancient days when pressed by his enemies had escaped from them by wading along the bed of a stream so that all traces of his footsteps were lost the only question was whether our enemies would take the troubles to hunt us so far and if they did not we should have had all our pains for nothing however as it was the safest plan we stepped into the stream on we went down it feeling with our sticks for fear of tumbling into a hole the water was fortunately shallow and the bed tolerably smooth so we got on better than we should have done on dry ground at last the water which had been growing deeper and deeper came almost up to our hips and we agreed that it would be safer to land and try and make our way through the bushes or near the stream which would serve as a guide i cannot tell you how delighted we were after we had gone on in this way for a couple of hours to see before us with the stars reflected on its smooth surface the broad channel of the river we could scarcely believe that we had reached it in so short a time we forgot indeed how far we had galloped and the distance we had come on foot 
we at once began to look along the shore for a spot where we might hide ourselves while we rested for as you may suppose we were very tired for fear that the smoke would betray us we dared not light a fire which we should have liked to do to dry our wet clothes however we sat down and emptied our shoes of water which we had been afraid of taking off for fear of hurting our feet and wrung out our socks and trousers our hopes of ultimately escaping depended we believed on our being seen by some vessel going up or down the river but before one should appear we might we knew full well be overtaken by the gauchos sleepy as we both were we agreed that one of us must be ever on the watch while the other slept we tossed up who should keep the first watch it came to my lot so desmond lay down and i sat by his side trying hard to keep awake and i must confess that it was about the most difficult job i ever had in my life i winked at the stars till they all seemed winking at me i pinched myself black and blue i rubbed my hands i kicked my feet but all to no purpose i kept blinking and nodding as much as ever i should have been off in another moment so i jumped up and took several short turns along the shore the thought that a jaguar might spring on gerald prevented me from going far as i got to the farther end of the beat i had marked out for myself i stopped for i fancied that i heard some curious squeaking and grunting not unlike that made by a litter of very young pigs i listened attentively and crept silently towards the spot the sounds came from beneath the roots of an old tree i suspected that they must be produced by a litter of capybaras or water hogs which creatures as you know frequent these shores in great numbers i marked the spot so as not to mistake it should we not be able to catch the old animals we might secure the young ones if hard pressed for food this raised my spirits and i was able to keep awake thinking of the best way to trap them when my watch was over i awoke desmond and told him what i had discovered he agreed with me that we need have no fear of starving capital he answered and i dare say that we shall find some roots and nuts i am afraid however that we shall have to eat our meat raw i observed that would be better than having no meat to eat and i dare say a young capybara will be very tender desmond let me sleep on till daylight or rather he fell asleep and neither of us awoke till the rising sun struck in our eyes we then discovered that the spot where we lay was exposed to the view of any one coming up or down the river to our left rising directly out of the river were some high cliffs but we were concealed by the overhanging bushes from any one standing on their summit while on our right down the river beyond the mouth of the valley the ground was broken and covered with trees and shrubs we could see no plantations or cottages or any sign that the country was inhabited we had therefore hopes that we should be able to conceal ourselves till we could get on board some passing vessel provided we could in the meantime obtain food but on that score we were not much troubled having hung up our shoes and trousers to dry in the sun we had a bathe which was very refreshing and then sat down and breakfasted on the dried meat and biscuit we brought with us the next most important thing we had to do was to find a secure hiding-place after hunting about we found a regular cave large enough to conceal half a dozen persons the mouth was very narrow which was all the better it was formed partly by the roots of a large tree the earth from beneath which had been washed away there was a hole between the roots which would serve as a chimney and we agreed that though it might be dangerous to light a fire in the daytime when the smoke would betray us we might venture to do so at night to hide the light we tore off a number of branches which we stuck into the ground in front of our cave having swept out and levelled the ground we considered that we had got a very comfortable abode we did not forget the old capybara and the young ones we had fitted nooses at the end of our wands and armed with these we crept close to the tree i had marked the squeaking was still going on within so we knew that dame capybara and her family were at home before long however out she came followed by five or six young ones in line we should have liked to try and noose her but she would have broken away from us so we waited for the last small one of her progeny 
i threw my noose over its head and whipped it up in a moment when gerald seizing hold of it quickly stopped its cries the old capybara turned round but we having got behind a tree she did not see us and she being unacquainted with arithmetic did not discover that one of her young ones was missing feeling pretty sure that we should be able to capture the others in the same way and perhaps catch her we returned to our cave here we amused ourselves by skinning and preparing the young capybara for the spit when it was ready we hung it up on a stick stuck in the wall we then set to work and formed a fireplace of earth and as soon as it was finished we went out again and collected a supply of firewood when this was done we were greatly tempted to light a fire and roast our capybara but prudence prevailed instead of that we hunted about and were rewarded by finding some berries and small plums which were very ripe and as we saw the birds eating them we had no doubt that they were wholesome we need have no fear of starving now faith observed gerald i am not certain but that i would rather live this robinson crusoe sort of life for a few weeks than go on board and have to keep watch come come you ought not to tell the commander that tom exclaimed gerald interrupting tom when he said this you know you agreed with me that it would be very jolly fun if it was not for the chance of being caught yes i know i did answered tom but remember i added if it were not for the anxiety we were causing my brother and lieutenant adair well youngsters observed jack it was very natural though you would have soon got tired of the life but how did you get on for the remainder of the time very well considering all things continued tom it was fortunate however that we did not light the fire for as i went down to the river to get some water in my shoe having nothing else to carry it in as i looked up towards the cliff i caught sight of several people standing on the top as their eyes were however directed further up the stream i hoped that they had not caught sight of me though i could not be sure at all events i quickly drew back and hurried to the cave to warn desmond of the danger we were in we at once went inside and covered up the entrance as well as we could with the boughs so that even should any one come to look for us and pass the spot we might escape discovery we lay down anxiously listening for any sound but none was heard and at last we both dropped off to sleep this must not happen again though i said to gerald when at length we awoke perhaps a vessel may have passed down the river while we were snoozing and we have lost our chance of getting on board those fellows were probably looking out for her this thought made us feel quite unhappy you certainly did lose your chance observed jack for a steamer which i spoke came down about that time and you might probably have got on board her i told you so gerald exclaimed tom i was but it does not matter now answered gerald all's well that ends well you are right but it might not have been so had we been shot by those fellows as we were swimming off to the supple jack's boat observed tom well i suppose you want me to cut my yarn short as soon as it was dark we lighted our fire which we should have been puzzled to do had not gerald had some few seeds in his pocket which he carries you will understand to give a light to any one who wants to smoke a cigar i understand observed jack laughing you of course mr desmond never dream of smoking one yourself only occasionally sir and tom and i had finished all i had when we were captured by the gauchos our fires burned well continued tom and we roasted our young capybara to perfection we only wanted salt and pepper and an onion or two to make it delicious as it was with the addition of a little brown bread we had remaining we made a good meal and slept like tops till daylight one of us you will understand regularly kept watch on the river while the other searched for provisions except when we wanted to catch another young capybara when we had to assist each other we captured the second in the same way we had the first with our long wands and nooses we also caught several birds after dark roosting on the branches of the trees we were afraid however to venture out as far as the plain above to look for partridges lest we might have been seen by any of the country people or soldiers who might have been on their way to the cliff i spoke of 
we found indeed that men were constantly on the watch for passing vessels and we should to a certainty have been discovered our chief exploit was catching the big capybara which we attempted when we had eaten nearly all her young ones we were afraid if we took the last that she might suspect that something was wrong and make off we accordingly got up at night when we thought that she would be asleep and placed a couple of nooses at the mouth of her hole securing the end to a part of the root of the tree which rose above the ground we then went back to our cave and roasted the last of the young ones we had caught as usual we kept watch by turns we had become somewhat anxious at night for we could not help thinking that the smell of our roast pig might attract some keen-scented jaguar to the spot and i can tell you that the thought of being snatched up at any moment by one of those beasts made us keep our eyes about us and prevented us from going to sleep i know it did me and i am pretty sure that gerald was not more comfortable in his mind on the subject than i was it was my morning watch and as soon as daylight returned i called gerald and we crept carefully up to the capybara's hole we had not long to wait before we heard her barking for strange to say though she was like a pig she did not grunt she was calling to her solitary young one to get up i suppose presently we felt a pull on one of our lines and directly afterwards the other was drawn taut we gave each of them a jerk and then springing forward with our sticks we were just in time before the capybara drew back into her hole to give her a couple of stunning blows on the head we quickly had her out and a few more blows deprived her of life it occurred to us that if we dragged her up to our cave the track might lead any passer-by to it we therefore fastened her legs together and carried her on one of our sticks the little one following wondering i dare say why its mother had taken to move in so curious a fashion and not seeming to notice us desmond proposed that we should tame it but as we could not manage to find it food we were obliged to kill it not being expert butchers we were employed most of the day in skinning and cutting up the beasts our chief puzzle was to know what to do with the offal at last we put it into the skin and carrying it down at night threw it into the river in the meantime our cave had the not over pleasant odour of a butcher's shop in hot weather while we were in the constant apprehension of a visit from a jaguar our regret was that though we had a superabundance of meat we should soon be reduced to short commons as it was not likely to keep even when cooked for more than a couple of days we had just returned from the river having accomplished the task i spoke of and had lighted our fire when we heard a rustling of the leaves at the entrance the flames just then blazing up brightly the next instant we caught sight of the savage-looking head of one of the monsters we dreaded which had poked its way between the boughs and was apparently about to spring on us desmond instinctively laid hold of the first thing which came to hand this happened to be one of the capybara's legs which we were about to spit we then seized our sticks to fight for our lives but the jaguar having caught the tempting morsel either satisfied with it or frightened by the bright flames and our sticks which we flourished in his face sprang back and bounded away with the meat in his mouth having repaired our fence and made it as we hoped more secure we returned to cook and eat our supper i confess that neither of us felt very comfortable on watch that night lest the jaguar should come back for a further supply of capybara that was only last night we little thought at the time how soon our robinson crusoe life was coming to an end though pleasant in some respects it was not as you see without its drawbacks directly the supple jack hove in sight we recognized her but having seen the enemy on the top of the cliffs we were in great doubt whether we should succeed in getting off it seems indeed a wonder to me that we were not killed and i only hope we feel sufficiently grateful for our preservation i am afraid tom that we are not and never can be sufficiently grateful for the mercies shown to us observed jack gravely if we had not been watched over and taken care of we should none of us be here at the present moment now as you and desmond look somewhat sleepy go and turn in gerald was half asleep already and tom having given one or two significant yawns they were both very glad to obey jack's order End of section thirty three
section thirty four of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter twenty seven the supple jack reaches boxada de santa fe plans for the protection of the fleet when returning a night expedition to survey an island alarm magnificent exploit rocket battery peppers the batteries of san lorenzo to some effect squadron passes unharmed escape of the boat monte video reached the supple jack continued her course up the river and the following day got beyond the reach of rosa's flying artillery tom and gerald having been well fed during their adventures were not much the worse for them and after a good night's sleep were well able to return to their duty they of course had to repeat their adventures to their own messmates and needham and snatchblock were also eager to hear all about them at last the brig reached boxadar de santa fe a town of some size built partly at the foot and partly on the side of a lofty hill which rises above the river it is surrounded by corrals or cattle farms where thousands of animals are slaughtered for the sake of their hides and tallow alone which are shipped from the port as there are not human mouths sufficient to consume the enormous quantities of beef it is thrown away and carried off by vast flocks of galanasas caracaras carrion crows and other birds of prey which hover over the country their appearance and the odour arising from the putrefying flesh making the place far from agreeable here the supple jack found a large fleet of merchantmen which had been further increased by others which had come down the river the question was how they all were to get back again to the sea two or three steamers which came up after the supple jack had suffered by a hot fire opened on them from the batteries newly thrown up by rosas several officers and men having been killed and wounded the most formidable batteries were those at san lorenzo which were now completed and it could not be expected that the fleet would be allowed to repass them without a strong opposition several plans were thought of the blue jackets and marines might land and storm the batteries but such an undertaking could only be carried out with great loss of life as the troops of rosas were not to be despised and as the batteries were open in the rear they could not be held without a strong force some weeks were spent at this most undelectable of places so that everybody was eager to return no one however knew what plan of operation had been determined on at length the long-looked-for signal was hoisted and the fleet of men-of-war and merchant vessels got under way and proceeded down the stream they presented a truly beautiful spectacle as their clouds of white canvas covered the entire breadth of the river and certainly never before had so many vessels floated together on its waters on the thirty first of may they came to an anchor on the entre rios shore about four miles above the formidable batteries of san lorenzo still no one besides the commander and a few officers entrusted with the secret knew what plan had been determined on all that the rest were certain of was that a plan had been formed and should it prove successful that the fleet might escape a severe handling but otherwise that the guns of san lorenzo if well served might sink or damage every ship in the squadron indeed the deep water channel down which the ships must pass was only about three hundred yards from the guns of the enemy and which from their elevation could send a plunging fire directly down on their decks in front of the batteries about twelve hundred yards from them was one of an archipelago of islands extending for some miles along the eastern or entre rio shore of the river covered with trees brushwood and reeds 
the passages between these islands and the eastern shore were much too shallow for the navigation of vessels of any size of necessity therefore the whole fleet had to pass under the high cliff of san lorenzo crowned by its formidable batteries the skippers of the merchantmen were quaking in their shoes believing that the men of war must be sent to the bottom and effectually block up the channel so that they would be caught in a trap and fall into the hands of the tyrant rosas all sorts of reports were flying about some said that one hundred heavy guns were planted on the top of the cliffs and that red-hot shot and missiles of all sorts would be showered down on them but still the commodore kept the plan he proposed to adopt secret the officers of the men-of-war however felt confident that whatever it was it would most likely succeed terence had returned to his ship jack was now alone he was seated in his cabin when a lieutenant from one of the steamers came on board come rogers you are wanted by the commodore as you are not only to be let into the secret of the plan but to assist in carrying it out jack highly delighted jumped up and buckling on his sword accompanied his brother officer on board the flagship the expedition was immediately to start to examine the island in front of the batteries the plan was simple in the extreme should shelter be found on the island it was proposed to plant a rocket battery behind it and as the ships came down to throw up showers of rockets into the fort so as to drive the spaniards from their guns till the whole fleet had passed evening was drawing on the boat was ready the english and french commodores lieutenant mckinnon the designer of the scheme jack and several other officers went in her the oars were muffled nothing was said above a whisper and with just sufficient light for them to see their way they pulled through the narrow passages between the islands completely hidden from the western shore till they had reached the large one directly opposite the batteries the dim outline of which they could discern between the trees just as the boat's bows touched the oozy bank a loud rustling was heard and they fully expected that a jaguar was about to spring upon them the officers drew their swords to defend themselves for had they ventured to fire a musket or pistol they would have been betrayed they looked anxiously not knowing on whom the animal might spring when greatly to their relief they saw not a jaguar but a harmless capybara or water hog which plunged into the water and swam to the opposite bank the officers now landed the seniors first stepping on shore and made their way over swampy ground through brushwood to the opposite or western shore of the island directly under the batteries they proceeded in silence crouching down for fear of being perceived their object being to ascertain what shelter was to be found for the rocket battery which it was proposed to plant greatly to their satisfaction they discovered that nature or rather the river itself when swollen by the rains had constructed a bank in every possible way suited for the object in view indeed it was such that one hundred men working for a week could not have thrown up one to equal it everything being thus found as they could wish they returned to complete the necessary arrangements still of course not a word of the plan was made known on board the fleet lest by any means spies might carry it to the ears of rosas the wind was now blowing up the river so that even had everything been ready the fleet of sailing vessels could not move the next night the rocket party under the command of lieutenant mckinnon the originator of the plan took their departure in the paddle-box boat of the steamer to which he belonged consisting of twelve men of the marine artillery the same number of seamen and four officers jack though well inured to danger could not conceal from himself the risk that must be run a pistol going off or the slightest want of caution of the party might betray them to the enemy when boats would be sent across to attack them though they might make a good fight with their rockets they would in all probability be cut to pieces before assistance could reach them in perfect silence the boat left the ship 
few with the exception of those immediately engaged being aware where she was going with muffled oars they pulled along the narrow channel amid the reed-covered islands keeping a lookout lest any of the enemy's boats might be on the watch rosas however did not suspect their design and at length without accident they reached the spot at the back of the island which had been fixed on for effecting a landing it was a little bay formed by a point of land on one side of it running out some twenty feet or more into the stream close to this point a large willow tree had fallen into the river the boat was run in between the branches which assisted to conceal her a number of boughs were also cut and stuck into the shore by her side some being laid across her so that she was completely hidden from any passer-by as soon as this was done the party commenced landing the rocket stands and rockets the men found it very fatiguing as they had first to cross a swamp into which they sank up to their knees and they then had a considerable distance to go over rough and uneven ground among thick roots and brushwood till they reached the bank where the rocket stands were to be planted all hands however worked without a murmur and soon had the rocket stands placed and so directed that the rockets might as they hoped just clear the top of the batteries and fall in among the men at the guns the men pretty well knocked up returned to the boat where however a glass of grog apiece and some pork and biscuit soon set them right again an officer and two men being left to watch the stands and rockets the rest turned in under a tarpaulin spread over the boat where they went to sleep the wind however continued blowing up the river and the fleet could not move they found that even in daylight they could walk in safety across the island by crouching down under the bushes till they gained the shelter of the bank the guards could thus be relieved at stated intervals twenty-eight embrasures with heavy guns in them were counted in the forts at the top of the cliffs instead of the hundred which had been talked of these however if well served were sufficient to produce fearful damage among the fleet if not to destroy it entirely so near were the batteries that with pocket telescopes the party could distinguish the faces of the people in them among others they discerned general moncelia a brother-in-law of rosas who drove up in his carriage with four horses and inspected the troops and guns little suspecting that his enemies were crouching down so near him the men had of course received strict instructions not on any account to show themselves the second night while lieutenant mckinnon was watching the batteries through his telescope he observed the sentry suddenly stop and narrowly eye the bank what was his dismay to find that one of his men had incautiously stepped forward into a spot where he could be seen hold fast whispered the lieutenant do not move as you value your life the man obeyed and to his infinite relief the sentry at last moved on a few more days passed the officer spent most of the time under the bank while the men lay concealed in the boat at length when dawn broke on the morning of the fourth day to the satisfaction of every one a fresh steady breeze was blowing down the river the men were roused up and eagerly made their way crouching as before among the brushwood to the bank here they lay down at the foot of the rocket stands ready at a preconcerted signal to start up and open their fire at any moment had they been discovered the guns from the battery might have opened on them and blown them to atoms but fortunately the eyes of the enemy were turned up the stream towards the point from whence the ships were expected to appear two guns fired from the flagship was to be the signal that the fleet had got under way about nine a m the welcome sound reached their ears a long pole with the flag of old england fastened at the end was to be planted on the top of the bank at the elevation of which the first discharge of rockets was to take place 
with eager eyes they watched for the appearance of the squadron the ships of war were at length seen the steamers leading followed by a line of merchantmen one coming after the other till the sternmost was lost in the distance it was a grand sight as they came silently gliding on till the leading ships got within range of the batteries the instant they did so they commenced firing their shells with admirable precision at length the leading ships reached the channel which lay between the cliffs and the island the long-looked-for moment had arrived the commander of the expedition waved his cap when jack who had charge of the flagstaff leaped boldly up on the bank and planted it in the ground the ensign flew out to the breeze it was a signal for the first discharge of rockets up hissing loudly they flew while jack taking off his cap made a polite bow to the enemy and quickly leaped off the bank under shelter the rockets curving over the heads of the ships two of them pitched into the very centre of the most crowded part of the batteries completely driving the gunners from their guns two went over their heads and two stuck in the cliffs beneath them the elevation of the rocket stands which had been wrongly pointed being quickly rectified they were once more charged and as soon as the enemy had returned to their guns and were looking along the sights to take aim at the steamers lieutenant mckinnon jumped up on the embankment thoughtless of how he was exposing himself and sung out pepper lads pepper 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 up flew the rockets with admirable aim scattering destruction among the men thickly crowded in the batteries those who were not killed deserted their guns the slaughter among the troops of rosas must have been terrific in one minute forty rockets were poured in among them a still louder sound was then heard and smoke and flames were seen ascending from the batteries a rocket had penetrated an ammunition cart which had blown up increasing the confusion all this time the fleet of merchantmen had been gradually approaching the men of war having already passed had taken up a position from which they could throw their shells into the batteries so what with the shells from the ship's guns and the flights of rockets the gunners even though driven back again and again to their guns were unable to take aim at the ships while the batteries were shrouded by the smoke from the ammunition wagon the grass under the bank catching fire the rocket party were surrounded by so dense an atmosphere that it was impossible for some moments to see what was going forward the wind however soon blew the murky veil aside when the white sails of the merchantmen the sun shining brightly on them were seen gliding by flights of rockets being sent up the whole time in rapid succession till the sternmost ship of the squadron was well out of range of the batteries the enemy now directed their fire at the island aiming at the flagstaff which however was some distance from the rocket party though the shot came plunging down on either side the flag still waved defiantly in their faces while the rockets continued to be sent up but at length the enemy discovering the point from whence they came turned their guns in the right direction the shot however either buried themselves in the bank or flying over the heads of the gallant little band went bounding away across the island the signal of recall was now seen flying from the flagship and the order for decamping was given the people being directed to scatter as widely as possible and to make their way as rapidly as they could without exposing themselves more than was necessary to the boat the men shouldered the rocket stands the remaining rockets and everything belonging to them we must not leave the flagstaff behind cried jack springing to the top of the bank he hauled it out of the ground and waving it in the faces of the enemy leaped down again just in time to escape a shot which came flying over his head now lads run for it cried the officer in command and at the word the whole party set off scampering along through the brushwood towards the boat 
while the shot came whistling after them clipping off the branches of the trees on either side or plunging into the ground behind them or whistling over their heads but thick as had been the shower of iron missiles when they reached the boat to their mutual satisfaction not a single man had been hit the boat was quickly cleared of the willows which concealed her and shoved out into the stream out oars was the word and away she flew down the river to join the squadron as they passed the large island to the south of the one they had occupied they observed three merchantmen which had got on shore from keeping too much over to the east side the boats of the squadron had just come up and were engaged in hauling them off two were got free but the third being immovable was set on fire to prevent the enemy from benefiting by her cargo no other vessel was lost but slight damage was suffered by even those most exposed to the enemy's guns and not a man was hit the flames of the burning vessel cast a lurid glare from bank to bank as the fleet was flying colours proceeded down the broad stream on their voyage to monte video rosas made no further attempt to molest them he had received a lesson which he was not likely to forget his power was broken and he soon afterwards had to fly the country the british and french squadron on their arrival at monte video found however that there was still work to be done some of the allies of rosas had been engaged in attempting its capture but they were quickly put to flight and a body of marines and bluejackets were sent on shore to assist the inhabitants in placing the city in a better position of defence end of chapter twenty seven section thirty five of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter twenty eight letter from murray jack's reply the supple jack ordered home the voyage a gale long tom's burial a wreck seen and boarded stella and her friends rescued arrival in england murray's anxiety relieved the fate of the supple jack murray's wedding jack awakes from his dream a visit to bally mccree jack caught at last conclusion jack found letters from england at monte video for him and among them was one from murray he wrote much out of spirits mr bradshaw had deferred his departure from jamaica and stella who had waited for his escort was not likely to arrive in england for some time wrote murray i would have gone out myself to escort her home but as she and her friends may sail any day i might possibly on my arrival find that they had left the island i must remain therefore in england till i hear something more definite of their intentions i have received orders to pay off the tutor so that i shall shortly be a free man i have not heard whether the carib the ship for which mr bradshaw is waiting is bound for london or liverpool and i am therefore at a loss where to take up my quarters to await her arrival of course i am very anxious to be on the spot to meet stella i trust that as i am not likely to be employed again for some time she will not consider it necessary longer to defer our marriage and i sincerely hope my dear jack that you will be at home to act as my best man jack wrote a reply by terence whose ship was on the point of sailing for england nothing i can wish for would give me greater pleasure than to take care of you on the awful occasion to which you allude keep up your spirits my dear alec for i feel very sure that if you are not already spliced by the time i arrive in england that i shall have the satisfaction not long afterwards of attending you 
as you propose i cannot believe that so sensible a girl as miss o'regan is will longer defer your happiness should she contemplate so cruel a proceeding i must get my sisters mary and lucy to argue the point with her and depend upon it they will bring her round i have promised terence to pay him a visit to ballymacree but i told him that i cannot go till i see you settled should you find your fair one's obdurate heart soften before i arrive he will be delighted to undertake the post you offer me and i cannot wish for a better substitute he begs me to say this and you well know that next to me you have not a truer friend he has promised to come and stay with us at halliburton after he has paid a flying visit to his own home and we hope to meet you and mrs murray there as my father and mother propose asking you to take it in your way to the north where we conclude you will wish to introduce your bride to the highland home you have so often described to us jack said a good deal more indeed his letter was one of the longest he had ever indicted he of course also wrote home begging sir john to invite murray to stay at halliburton till the arrival of the carib terence promised to post the letters as soon as he got on shore or to deliver murray's which was directed to his agent should he by chance be at portsmouth good-bye said terence as they parted we shall meet again before long depend upon that for i hear that your brig is to be sent home as soon as a steamer comes from england to relieve you they have an idea that such vessels are more likely to prove efficient slave hunters than such small craft as yours jack took an active part in the work going forward at montevideo and when it was over he began eagerly to look out for the expected orders to return home two steamers at last arrived the second came to relieve the supple jack without an hour's delay having already received on board fuel and fresh provisions the anchor was hove up and under all sail a course was steered for old england her crew gave three hearty cheers as she glided out from among the ships destined to remain behind desmond had continued on board her as terence considered that the longer he remained afloat the better as it might not be so easy to get him another ship except a pampiro which had not jack been wide awake might have taken the masts out of the brig or sent her where many a vessel of her class has gone to the bottom nothing of consequence occurred until she had got considerably to the north of the line she had reached about the latitude of madeira when a heavy gale sprang up for three days she lay exposed to its fury so severely tried that jack entertained serious thoughts of heaving long tom overboard needham gazed at his old friend with sorrowful eye as jack suggested that such might be necessary he has done good service and she has carried him a good many thousand miles without complaining sir and unless it comes on worse than it is at present she will carry him home safe enough i hope it however did come on worse and moreover a leak was sprung which required half the watch constantly at the pumps long tom was doomed jack tried to comfort needham by saying from what i hear when the ship is paid off he will only be looked on as so much old iron or laid up in the gun wharf never to bark again so we shall do him more honour by lowering him into an ocean grave the order was given and as the brig rolled long tom sent over the side into the foaming waters the brig evidently floated more buoyantly on being relieved of his weight at length the gale broke and sail being made the supple jack once more stood on her course evening was coming on dark leaden seas still 
foam-topped were rising up sullenly around her as she made her way amidst them now on the summit of one now sinking into the valley below when the lookout shouted the hull of a ship either dismasted or on her beam ends away on the lee bow sir jack went aloft with his telescope she is a dismasted vessel there is little doubt about that he observed to bevan as he returned on deck keep the brig away from her evening was approaching but jack hoped to be up with the stranger before dark as the brig drew near her she was seen to be a large ship her three masts gone while no attempt apparently had been made to rig jury masts so deep was she that as she rolled in the heavy seas the water came rushing over her decks and gushing out through the scuppers on the opposite side jack felt thankful that he had seen her as in all probability her fate during the night would have been sealed the brig was steered to pass just under her stern jack intending to heave to to leeward just as she got up to her tom exclaimed i see her name it is the carib the very ship in which mr bradshaw intended to come to england the eyes of all on board were turned towards the wreck no one was seen on the deck she must have been abandoned but i trust that her passengers have been taken off by some other vessel for should they have left in the boats their chance of escaping in the heavy sea which has been running would have been small indeed said jack feeling very anxious as he thought of stella and murray possibly the boats may have not long left her observed bevan you may be right said jack send a couple of men with the sharpest eyes to look out in case they may be still in sight just then a person was seen emerging from the companion hatch who no sooner discovered the brig than he waved his hands and appeared to be frantically imploring assistance it is mr bradshaw himself exclaimed jack who had been looking through his telescope he immediately ordered a boat to be lowered and sung out for volunteers i will go myself bevan he said take charge of the brig needham was the first to step in others quickly followed and jack with some of his best men pulled away through the heavy seas towards the ship it was no easy task to get alongside without the risk of having the boat knocked to pieces jack watched his opportunity and followed by needham and tim mullins one of the men sprang on board as he did so he ordered the boat to keep off till he called her thank heaven you have come exclaimed mr bradshaw as he grasped his hand quick quick the ladies are in the cabin i charged them not to come on deck for fear of being washed overboard but from the heavy way the ship is rolling i suspect that she has not much longer to swim indeed she has not i fear exclaimed jack rushing into the cabin stella was seated on a sofa supporting miss bradshaw who overcome with alarm or illness appeared to have fainted while polly was kneeling by her side helping her mistress miss o'regan looked amazed at seeing jack he without waiting to utter an exclamation seized her in his arms and carried her on deck needham took up miss bradshaw while tim who had accompanied him tucked polly under his arm if you have nerve to leap at the proper time as the boat comes alongside do so said jack to mr bradshaw if not wait and i will come back for you jack shouted to the men in the boat to return and waiting till she was close to let himself down into her holding stella firmly with one arm needham and tim dropped safely with their burdens at the same time mr bradshaw still remained on board let me go sir cried needham i will help him and the next moment he was again on deck seizing mr bradshaw by the hand he watched the proper opportunity and dragged him down into the boat both falling though being caught by the men they were not much hurt jack then sheered the boat off from the wreck and ordered his men to pull away towards the brig scarcely had they got clear than the ship's stern was seen to lift and her bows plunging into the next sea which came rolling up 
it rushed over her deck foaming and hissing she in a few seconds disappearing beneath the surface the boat having only just got beyond the influence of the vortex she created there was no time to ask questions jack being at the helm could with difficulty attend to the two ladies who lay in the stern sheets stella still attending on her friend the boat was quickly again alongside the brig and jack and needham lifted the two ladies safely on board mr bradshaw was then helped up the side by the seamen and the boat being hoisted in the brig again made sail and stood on her proper course the ladies were at once conveyed to jack's cabin and mctavish being sent for his appliances soon restored miss bradshaw to consciousness so much taken up had stella been in attending her friend that she had had no time to thank her preserver or to speak a word on any other subject jack had also been too fully occupied to ask questions mr bradshaw now told him that the carib had been struck suddenly by the gale and her masts carried away at the same time the captain and his mates with several of the crew had either been washed or struck overboard or killed by the falling masts and that the rest of the crew left without officers had when they believed the ship to be sinking taken the only boat which remained as they had previously broken open the spirit-room they were probably before long overwhelmed by the heavy sea we would not have gone with them had they invited us to do so for we did not then believe that the ship was about to founder continued mr bradshaw when we discovered the awful truth having no means of escaping we gave ourselves up as lost and when you appeared we were awaiting the event which we knew must soon occur jack of course said how thankful he was that he had been providentially directed to the spot in time to save their lives he then mentioned alec murray and asked stella when she had last heard from him telling her of the letter he himself had received hers was of about the same date poor fellow added jack he seems dreadfully out of spirits and i trust miss o'regan that you will do your best to restore them stella said nothing but fanny bradshaw told jack that she did not think her friend would longer be obdurate i hope not he answered i have promised to be his best man and i wish to fulfil that engagement before i pay a visit to my old friend adair at ballymacree you of course will be one of the bridesmaids fanny said that she had little doubt about that and changed the subject by making inquiries respecting bally mccree jack of course gave the description he had received from terence and your friend has a number of pretty irish sisters asked fanny irish of course they are and as to their beauty terence has not said much about that except that his sister kathleen is an attractive girl and observed that i should be able to form an opinion myself on the matter fanny did not ask many more questions about bally mccree jack at first feared that it might be necessary to put into funchal but the weather becoming fine the leaks were kept under by dint of constant pumping and at last the supper jack reached soundings in the chops of the channel the wind held fair and she was not long in running up it her leaky condition was a sufficient excuse for going at once into portsmouth harbour without waiting for orders jack immediately went on shore to report his arrival to the admiral he was again hurrying on board to escort the ladies and mr bradshaw to an hotel when who should he meet but admiral triton looking scarcely a day older than when he last saw him jack my boy i am rejoiced to see you exclaimed the old man and the more so as i want your assistance in consoling a heartbroken friend of yours alec murray he has just received intelligence that the ship in which the young lady he expected to marry was coming home was seen by a vessel just arrived dismasted in mid-atlantic and as the gale continued for several days afterwards great fears are entertained for her safety my task will be an easy one then admiral cried jack for i have all her passengers safe on board my brig 
and if you can tell me where he is to be found the sooner i relieve his mind the better let us jump into a hackney coach and we shall soon be there exclaimed the admiral jack brought the joyful intelligence to murray whom he found almost prostrated it quickly had the effect of reviving him and accompanied by the admiral they were soon on board the supplejack whether or not murray asked stella the question on that occasion does not matter but very shortly afterwards fanny told jack that all was settled and that she had promised to become his soon after their arrival in london where her father intended to remain for some weeks alick escorted the ladies and mr bradshaw to town the next day after they had somewhat recovered their fatigue by a night's rest jack had to remain at portsmouth to pay off the brig though he would rather have accompanied his friends admiral triton stopped also as he said to look after tom and desmond but in reality to hear the yarns which he made the youngsters spin about their adventures it did not take long to pay off the poor little supplejack which was then towed up the harbour and placed on the mud never again to float on blue water needham heaved a deep sigh as he heard the report of her destined fate it was too true he found she was to become a target for the guns of the excellent well well he said she has done good service in her day it is better to be of use to the last than to be broken up as is the lot of many a once stout ship for firewood through the interest of admiral triton needham got charge of a ship in ordinary where he hoped to remain till he should get appointed to one on active service jack immediately on his arrival wrote to terence who had gone to ballymacree he had invited desmond to accompany tom to halliburton in reply terence begged him to come over to ireland as soon as he could tear himself away from home nor is of course anxious to see her boy he added so i beg you will bring him over and tom also if his mother and sisters can spare him jack however was very doubtful about going to ballymacree at all he had been greatly attracted by the person and manners of fanny bradshaw though to be sure she had not said anything to make him suppose that she regarded him in any other light than that of a friend who had rendered her and her father an essential service well i will try it however thought jack perhaps at murray's wedding i shall be able to judge better how she feels towards me admiral triton accompanied his young friends up to london where they remained a couple of days he taking them to see every sight that could by any possibility be inspected during the time while jack spent most of his time with murray at the bradshaws when he bade farewell after having promised alick to return in a couple of weeks he felt quite as uncertain as at first as to fanny's feelings towards him of course every one was delighted to see him at halliburton tom and desmond were as happy as the day was long they only wished that archie gordon who had gone back to his friends in scotland could have been with them gerald desmond behaved with wonderful discretion and propriety really jack if lieutenant adair is as quiet and steady as his nephew appears to be we need no longer fear should he come here that he will play the tricks we once supposed he would observed lucy i always told you that terence is as well conducted a young irishman as one can wish to meet with answered jack i will ask him to come over and pay us his long-promised visit before i go to ballymacree and he then can attend murray's wedding with me jack rode and terence accepted the invitation and came lucy confessed that she thought lieutenant adair was the most pleasing right-minded gentleman she had ever met of course he is said jack but then remember that he is a half-pay navy lieutenant and that his paternal estate is in the encumbered estate court the day before murray's wedding jack and terence went up to london and at once called at his lodgings they found a gentlemanly-looking man with the cut of a lawyer seated with him he significantly introduced his friend as mr stapleton who is to undergo the same fate for which i am destined to-morrow after some 
lively conversation mr stapleton took his departure who is he asked jack he seems a very happy fellow he is the destined husband of fanny bradshaw answered alick matters for certain reasons were not settled till after you left town and therefore mr bradshaw did not inform you of the cause of his coming to england it has been a long engagement and as stapleton could not go out to the west indies fanny wisely consented to come to england and she and stella arranged if possible to marry the same day jack said nothing he was suddenly awakened from his dream and he very soon began to doubt whether he had been as desperately in love with fanny as he had supposed after all at all events he could earnestly wish her and her husband every happiness the wedding took place and he appeared with as serene a countenance as terence who at the breakfast made a capital speech and was the life of the party the same evening jack with terence and the two midshipmen set off by the hollyhead mail bound for ballymacree jack did not lose his heart at first sight but he at all events thought kathleen adair more charming than her west indian cousins or any of the young ladies he had met in the neighbourhood of halliburton or indeed than fanny bradshaw herself he could not help it whether wisely or not telling her so one day and as she forthwith accepted him he had to write home and inform his father of the fact sir john in reply promised his sanction and blessing provided the young lady would wait till he was a commander kathleen said that she would wait till he was an admiral if he wished but observed that for her part she could not see why a lieutenant should not make as good a husband as a captain it was a wonder that the two midshipmen did not break their necks out hunting or finish themselves off in some other way but happily while still sound in limb both they jack and terence received orders to join a ship fitting out for the east indies the arrangement having been made at sir john's instigation by their old friend admiral triton end of section thirty five end of the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston